Hey, Hammy here, back with part two, on which we are discussing the careless Linnaean system of classification and all the different parts of that. Uh, careless Linnaeus is considered the father of kind of modern taxonomy. Uh, he was actually uh, pretty ambitious. Um, he tried to classify all of the known natural world. Yeah, he tried to take everything that all the plants, animals, fungi, everything we knew of, and he wrote a book, Systema Natura, okay, which you can see a copy of down here, on which he tried to classify all of the living things that we know of. And he did, divided nature, the living stuff, into two kingdoms. Uh, divided them into plants and animals. And then everything else, there was kind of a third kingdom uh, that's listed sometimes, <clears throat> which would be the minerals. But this was kind of the non-living stuff. And so a lot of times we just say he uh, divided all of the living stuff into two kingdoms, plants and animals. And you either, and you fell into one of those two categories. Uh, when we... When we look at the Linnaean system, kind of as we use it today, uh, you start with the biggest tax uh, biggest taxon is kingdom. Now, in your notes, it's going from top down. Uh, here, this graphic here is showing the largest one, kingdom, uh, down here at the bottom. So you see kingdom includes all of these smaller groups. And then out of this small group right here, okay, you have, it's kind of enlarging that next group. Uh, the next group of organization, the next taxon or next level of organization right here. And if we look at <clears throat> how humans are classified, okay, we're in kingdom, animalia, uh, all the organisms that can move around on their own. Then we are broken down into a smaller chunk or a smaller group of chordates or animals that have backbones. And then we're broken down of all the animals with backbones we're put into a class with mammals uh, with fur or hair and have milk for their young. And then even further down into primates, uh, mammals with collarbones, uh, grasping fingers, okay? hominids, uh, which is more of like kind of a human uh, type, kind of, you know, us and the cavemen and those kind of things, relatively flat faces. Uh, have three-dimensional vision with our eyes facing forward. And then even, even more broke down into our genus, which is homo, hominids with an upright posture. Okay, big brains and we walk upright. And our species is sapiens. Okay, high forehead and thin skull brows, thin skull bone. Okay, and I, oftentimes this is the species name, but this whole thing is the scientific name. So oftentimes you'll see both listed again under the species category, even though uh, Homo is technically the genus name. Another thing with the Linnaean system uh, is one of the biggest benefits that he added to the classification systems at the time is this binomial nomenclature. Okay, if you look at the prefix, bi means to, okay, nom, like in Spanish, it was que es tu nombre, okay, Latin for name. So to name, nomenclature, okay, again, name, ming, uh, clature would be system. So if you look at the roots there, to name, naming system. On what this does, it gives each species a unique two-word name, okay, a scientific name. So if we look in the genus Panthera, all the panther-type cats, okay, you have the Panthera leo, which would be the lion, okay, the Panthera onca, which is the jaguar, Panthera pardus, leopard, and Panthera tigris, Okay, which is the tiger. Now, in the print, this doesn't show this, but in a scientific name, a couple things must be true. So I rewrote the line here, Panthero Leo, in proper formatting. I'm going to be picky about this. Okay, the genus name must always be capitalized. 
species name, lowercase, and the whole thing, when it's typed out, should be typed in italics. Uh, if you handwrite it, uh, then you should you should underline it. Okay, that's just a proper formatting uh, that you should be aware of <clears throat> when using scientific names. Okay, this two-word name refers to just the lions that we find in Africa. Okay, these lions and zoos and stuff, obviously. Okay, but it is all that species. That is the smallest group of individuals, remember the species concept, that uh, interbreed and have fertile offspring in nature. Uh, before Linnaeus, scientists were using Latin, uh, but they were these long descriptive names. Okay, for example, the wild rose <clears throat> uh, was Rosa Silvestris Alba Cum Robre Folio Glabro. Whew. And it were these big, long, cumbersome names. And when you were writing a lab report or using them in some writing, it was very, very cumbersome, not very useful. It was very descriptive and said exactly what it was, uh, but not useful uh, for scientists to be writing out all the, all the time to be using his names. So this two-name system, very, very good. Uh, and that's one of the long-lasting legacies of Linnaeus that we still use today. Uh, the final thing to note, though, is that this system is constantly being revised and changed uh, many times since the mid-1700s, early 1700s, when Linnaeus came up with it. Uh, we've, you know, as new organisms are discovered, uh, as like last chapter when we look at evolutionary relationships, uh, sometimes this is called phylogeny. Okay, or a phylogenetic tree, which looks kind of like a cladogram. Okay, this phylogeny, this phylogeny really groups things based on their evolutionary relationships. And so we kind of change where organisms are uh, but as we find out new stuff and do DNA testing and that kind of stuff. Uh, we've added several new taxa or levels. Uh, for example, you can have order, family, genus, species, but you might have uh, like a subphylum. Uh, sometimes you can have a super family uh, or even above the kingdom level, uh, we've added three domains, okay? Bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota, okay, eukarya. So we've add, actually added three domains above the kingdom level.